We are living through a transitional, transformative technology known as the internet. It is now finally 25 years old and mature. Everybody has it. Everybody has it all the time. And the whole world is getting flipped upside down. And you have an opportunity to take a piece of it. The problem is everybody wants to take the whole piece. Everybody's like, Gary, I'm gonna build the next Twitter or Uber or Facebook. Everybody's gonna build a billion dollar company. News alert, you're not building a billion dollar company. How about just building a company that you like and makes you happy? How about just doing something you like every day? Everybody's gotta, right? Like, how about that? How about people in here realizing that they have a job that might pay them a little bit more than something else, but they hate it, but they're not willing to live in a more humble home or drive a more humble car, and so they have a miserable job just to pay for shit that they have to impress other people that they don't even like. How about that fucking conversation? It has never been easier. I'm, and I don't like using the word easy, but I'm gonna say it. It has never been easier to make $100,000 a year because of this. The problem is everybody thinks you have to make a billion, and the problem is nobody has humility to live a $100,000 lifestyle. I think we have to change the conversation in our society. Seven billion people need to change the conversation of what success looks like. It is not to make a billion dollars, it is to actually wake up in the morning and be in a good mood. And whether that is me, who loves the game of entrepreneurship so much that he goes so hard every day because he just loves what he does, or if it's somebody who only wants to work 25 hours a week because they, all their other passions are so interesting to them and that's what is good for them, we have to allow for everything. We have to allow for everything because everything is true and everything is real. And you need to figure out, my biggest fear of my popularity is that you think you have to do it like me. The only hope I have when you look at me is that you try to figure out your version of you that makes you as happy as my version of me makes me. I wanna remind everybody here, I'm 43 years old, which means when I loved entrepreneurship in America, nobody else did. It was not popular. So I loved this thing before it was this thing. And guess what? When the economies collapse, everybody's gonna go off of entrepreneurship and go back to a job, and I'm gonna still love this thing. When it's not as cool as it is today when there isn't sneakers and fans, I'm gonna still like it because it's mine. I've always done it and I always will. You need to figure out that for you. Not what your parents think, not what I think, not what the comments think, you. Yeah. How would a creator balance ambition with, while also not overjudging themselves? I think it's just having a real conversation with yourself, you know, just really just going there. You know, like even though, you know, even the way you asked that question, obviously you've been listening enough of like either my themes or other themes or you got there yourself. Like the reality is, is that, you know, ambition and patience seem to be opposites, but when blended together really lead to a higher level of happiness and so, um, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uh, push harder for people to figure out how to get there. I think a lot of times when you know people think they might be complacent or not pushing hard enough, when they just need a rest, you know, and that's okay too. And so, I actually, you know, I find it, I find it easier now after, you know, I think it came natural to me after years of practice. But I think the fact that that's even on your radar is already a winning formula. Gotcha. You yeah, know, the fact, that, the fact that you're even debating that um, already puts you in a good spot. Yeah, I mean, I enjoy the process, so I, I love the hustle. I love working from the time I wake up to till the time I go to bed, I enjoy it. Um, yeah, just trying to figure out that balance mentally, not even so much in what I'm doing, but more just, you know, up here in the head. Um, I get it. But yeah, and then 
Um, any advice for starting a business with a family member? Because I know you've done stuff with AJ and and your yeah, dad. I mean, and- on that one, you just got to make sure that you value the person more than the money and the clout or respect. You know, it's a really challenging game, family businesses. Uh, but the reality is, is if you could just love somebody more than you love the money or the clout or the credit, then you'll be in a good spot. For me, it was more credit. It was more like, hey, dad, hey, AJ, I'm a better businessman than you. And and that creates friction. For for them, I think they, they value the dollars a little bit more. I don't judge that. I just think they do more than me. Uh, so that worked out a little bit in the fact that that's how that broke down with us. But I think you've got to figure out if the person that you're going into business with has the same ambitions as you do is it is it money is it is it you know the credit of who did it you know i think communication is just everything in life and definitely in in family businesses single biggest thing in my opinion that the majority of these people in this room are doing wrong this is number one i believe that 98% of the people in this arena right now buy too much dumb shit. I have become crazy fascinated as I've lived my life of trying to understand why the fuck so many of my parents' immigrants' friends, other immigrants, and just immigrants in general have a disproportionate success rate in the framework of America. And I finally figured it out. They're not smarter. It's not even necessarily that they work harder. It's that they come to America and they buy nothing stupid for 15 fucking years. They just live like shit, buy nothing, save money, buy a business, and move on. The level of insecurity that is permeating this country so that people end up buying cars and houses and clothes that they can't afford to impress people that they don't even like is the great epidemic in our society. I get to say this from truth. I lived my 20s, all my 20s, 22 to 29, my 20s in a shitty fucking apartment in Springfield, New Jersey, I didn't buy any fucking clothes. I didn't have swag fucking sneakers. I didn't, I went on no fucking vacations. I just fucking worked and saved money. And I was building a business for my parents, not even for myself. So when I tell people to be patient, it's easy because I lived it. I don't stand up here ever talking about shit that I didn't actually do first. And so, if you're not pumped, if you're not like loving life, Before you try to figure out the hook or the secret, or if you think Tony's gonna rejigger your fucking brain, or I'm gonna give you, or I'm gonna give you some fucking secret to do on fucking Instagram that's gonna change everything. Before you think about that, go home and look at your fucking credit card bill and stop buying dumb shit. Because when you don't buy dumb shit, that money stays in the fucking bank and you can do something with your fucking life instead of having a new pair of fucking off-whites. Who the fuck you flossing for? Fuck. Fuck, Chicago? You, you think somebody's gonna like you better because you're fucking got a new Audi, you dick? Jesus, and that is what is most interesting about this place because if you wanna look at this place in a negative way, it's super easy because everybody's fucking fake lifing on Instagram. You know how many people here are gonna go hiking this weekend for the fucking stupid picture? They don't wanna go hiking, they just wanna get a couple more likes on Instagram. I got fucking, I know people who jump the fence at night at private plane airports to take a photo to make pretend they fly private. Do you fucking understand what's going on? And then it gets deeper. There are people in bullshit relationships right now posting photos of themselves on vacation acting like they're fucking happy. My friends, this is a manifesto in Chicago this morning about executing on truths, that shit.
and let me give you very basic truths. If you spend money on shit you don't need, you're gonna lose. If you buy those things to impress other people, you've already lost. You need to take a step back and understand what are you doing. This is not a conversation today about making more money. Success means being happy. Not how much money you have. We are in the middle stages of mental unhappiness, mental issues in our country predicated on a lot of different things, not paying the piper in 2009 like we should have. We should just be getting out of a depression. But we all got bailed out. Let's start there. On the greatest generation of funny parenting I've ever seen in my life. My favorite thing going on in the world right now is 40 to 60 year olds shitting on millennials when they were the fuckers that raised those people. That's my favorite shit. These kids are so soft. No shit, dick, you gave them an eighth place trophy. (laughs) These kids don't take feedback well. No shit, dick, when their teacher yelled at them, you ran to the school and fucking fought like an asshole. Fuck, that pisses me off. (laughs) Guys, let kids lose. Let's, let's actually talk about losing. Micro losing is the greatest shit. I stand here in front of you today because the first 18 years of my life, the world told me I sucked and I lost at everything. I sucked at school, I wasn't big enough for sports, everything fucking sucked. That's right, bro. <laughs> but we're fucking here now. And we're here now because a singular person in my life, my mother, instilled such disproportionate self-esteem in me without creating entitlement. When I was nice to people, she fucking praised the shit out of it. When I struck out in a game, she didn't make pretend some shit was rigged. She said, the pitcher was better than you, dick. (laughs) The fine line, how many people here consume my content? I'm gonna give you a secret I've never said. All I am is the puppet and the byproduct of Tamara Vaynerchuk. What I'm trying to do for you is what she did for me. What Tamara, my mom Vaynerchuk, that's who I said, did for me was she positively and optimistically gave me a framework of the world, but she didn't create entitlement because when I lost, I lost and when I won, I won. And so when you look at my content, you can see certain times when it feels fucking a little rough and a little edgy, and other times when it's warm and fuzzy, it's because both exist. And everybody thinks you have to pick sides. It's like the bullshit in our country right now. People think you have to pick sides. Everybody starts with zero followers. I wanna remind everybody that everybody starts with zero followers. In 2007, When Twitter hit the scene, I spent six, seven, eight hours a day between 7 p.m. and two in the morning going on Twitter and replying to every single person that mentioned anything about wine for six hours a day for four years and still nobody knew who the fuck I was. So when I hear people put out three posts on LinkedIn after a keynote like this and then email me and say, hey Gary Vee, loved you in Chicago, great talk, but gotta tell you, you're wrong. And I reply, what happened? Well, I posted on LinkedIn and nothing good is happening. And then I ask, how long you been doing it? And like, well, I've posted twice for the last two weeks. And I reply, you're a fucking asshole. just looked at this dude and like, you you know when you can feel like, you, like how is anybody confused that it takes, let me say it very slowly, an obnoxious amount of work to create any level of success? There is so much confusion in this system about the amount of work ethic that needs to be deployed to actually have success. Let me tell you this, anybody you've ever met that made it worked their fucking face off. 
You know people that are rich that didn't. They inherited it, but they didn't make it. And the confusion of the one or two stories you hear about when it happened fast, like Instagram or Facebook, has confused everybody. And the amount of excuses we put into the system so that we don't have to do that work is remarkable. What's interesting is, the reason I have such a good framework on this is because I am one of the great all-time worst students in the history of this country. I mean it. I literally never opened a book in high school, did all my Scantron tests, C, B, C, B, A, C, B, A. If there's any kids in the crowds, I'm gonna give you a real good secret if you're in public schools. They just push you through. The reason I watch people live for the weekend and love Friday like it's the greatest shit ever because they hate their Monday through Friday so fucking much The reason I hear the system's broke, my boss is a dick, it doesn't work for me, I'm not for that, all the, it's just excuses not to do, it's the same shit I did from first grade to 12th grade because I didn't want to do that bullshit homework that meant nothing in real fucking life. The problem is, that shit ended when I was 18. You've got the rest of your life. Which gets me back to this. This thing freaks me out so much you can't imagine because the one thing this thing is, is actual opportunity that our grandparents didn't grow up with. This thing allows you to still be practical and maintain the job that you hate so you can pay off your student loans and your mortgage, but create your side hustle on here around the shit that you actually love, whether that's the fucking Chicago Bears, whether that's fucking sneakers, whether that's doing comedy skits, whether that's reincarnating the formula that your grandmother had for soup from your country that you're now gonna sell direct to consumer on the back of Uber Eats. I don't give a fuck what ridiculous thing comes out of your mouth. This thing, if you make content on it and understand where people actually pay attention, actually gives you a prayer for that to happen. If you grew up in a framework with parents or customs that really desperately overvalue outside affirmation, the opinions of your parents' parents or siblings because you come from, let's call it what it is, an immigrant background where there's a huge commonality there. Um, School, you were so deeply bought into school that the short-term affirmation of every 90 days with grades and report cards made you comfortable. It's very hard to then go into, hey, hey, this is what you should learn from entrepreneur land. Like, don't worry about it, it's all gonna be fine. That's very hard. fully built yourself as an animal to completely value outside judgment that is not based on the market but based on another human being. That's what I'd like people to learn, which is like, hey, like, what are we doing here? You've won the 400 trillion to one lottery of being a human being. Do you really want to live with regret? Like, do you not understand that the internet is the greatest optionality in the history of mankind? That our grandparents and everybody behind them had nowhere close to the options you sit with today? And really, like, what are you valuing that's making you conform into doing something that doesn't make you happy? Your current overhead? So sell your home and rent. That sounds crazy. You know, when I started talking about like, hey, in the pursuit of happiness, would you consider selling your home and renting? I mean, I got destroyed in the comments sections and a lot of the play like, like that I'm some horrible person. I'm like, how is living your life to pay the bills that you've created for yourself? That's all humans, all that humans do are create their own jails and then live within it. That's all we do. So, so knowing that that's very hard in a human way, the situation you have with your parents, all that stuff, the professional one feels like I have a prayer of communicating that and letting people, and here's my point. If you wanna be a professional skier or if you wanna start a a blog or podcast around cooking, my big thing is if you jump and start swimming, you know, this is riding a bike, kissing a boy or girl or, 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 you know, swimming. This is, it seems super scary until you do it and then you just laugh about why it felt so scary. Like if you go do that thing and live more humble, live with judgment, you could always get a job again. Like, I don't know, like I just, my great fear 
is regret. Because it is the obvious thing I see in people that are 80 to 100 years old that seems super scary. Nobody was thrilled that they played it safe. It just, you don't see it. And I think people should spend more time with 80 to 100 year olds that aren't their grandparents. I mean it, I mean it. I think people need context on life a little bit. I think people have a horrible relationship with time. Do you know how many people in this room are scared shitless of 30? Like it's some thing, it means nothing. But our society has decided to tell you that you have to figure it out and marry it and children and what are you talking about? 98% of the 59 year olds I know don't have it figured out. The hell are we supposed to have it all figured out at 30? 25, like people are making terrible decisions. Getting married because they think they're supposed to by this age. You know, like buying homes because they think they're supposed, like the rules of modern society have led to, everybody wants to blame technology, you know, and drug companies for, you know, all our problems. We need to blame our norms, our expectations, our ridiculous North Stars that have, make no sense. We're living, when I look at this young of a crowd, they're living to 110. There's an enormous amount of people in here that are gonna live to 110 and are freaking out that they don't have it figured out by 30. You're not even a fucking quarter of the way there yet. <laughs> what are we talking about? So in, you know, that's very heady stuff. In its practical layer of, of business and life and jobs and career, I think everybody owes it to themselves to start something on the side around something that they're really desperately in. You, the reason a lot of entrepreneurs are alco- or alco- are workaholics, <laughs> There's a whole, there's a whole different reason they're alcoholics. Honestly, I'll just go to that for a minute. Entrepreneurship is super lonely. I hate that entrepreneurship is cool now because people that are not entrepreneurs are jumping in and it is a dangerous, lonely game. If you're not a purebred, you will get eaten up. If you don't love losing and love the struggle and love the pushback, you will lose. You will be unhappy. But the reason that a lot of entrepreneurs are workaholics is because they love it. They got lucky. They like literally love, like I remember not loving it. I mean, being in school, looking at the clock from first period on, those days, one day in high school feels longer than the last decade of my life. I mean that. And I know there's an enormous amount of people here at this right exact moment that are already counting down Friday. And that's not good. And that's not good for Chase, and that's not good for them. And so we need a better debate. It's uncomfortably simple out there, which means it's ridiculously complicated. What I mean by that is, it's no different. What I'm gonna talk to you about, whether it's life or business right now, is really no different than if if this was a health conference. I would come and they would say, how do we get healthier? And I would stand up here and I would say, I'd like you to eat better and I'd like you to exercise every day. And I would say, thank you very much and I'm out. That's actually the answer. But we don't want to hear it. We'd rather buy $29 fucking apple vinegar shit. (laughs) We'd rather buy some fucking thing that fucking tightens your waist. And performance enhancement drugs. And fucking ass implants. And all this other shit. The reality is it's super simple. If for some way through a joke or an analogy or a conversation here today or an answer to a question, I can get you to start the process of genuinely being able to handle judgment because you finally are exhausted, exhausted of living your life based on other people's opinions, including Stranger Pants 96 and your mom, those two extremes. And listen, I know, how many of you here consume my content? Thank you. So for the ones that do, you know, my example is the anonymous comment from Sally Pants 49 or Rick Face or Jumpman 36. So it's the two extremes. It's you don't do things because somebody says you're ugly or you're stupid in a comment and you have no idea who they are and they're hiding between an avatar and some bullshit name over here all the way to your mom. That. 
That's what I spend all my time on. From this person to that person, why is that dictating you? This one makes a lot of sense to me. Ironically, that one makes a lot of sense to me. You all went through high school. You all lived life trying to do shit to impress other people. And we still do it at scale. The only thing, listen, I'm not out here living my life trying to convince people how to make money like me because making money is a talent like singing and playing sports. Some people are better at it than others. Can it be taught? Of course it can be taught. You can always be better at something than you were at a starting point. I can be better at dancing and singing and basketball, but I'm not fucking gonna be LeBron or Beyonce. Do I think people can go from the kind of person that can have a $40,000 a year business to a $3 million a year business? Yes, I do. Do I think the person that has the natural skill of a $40,000 a year business can make 45 million a year? No, I do not. Do I think that we completely need to recalibrate our relationship with what success looks like? Yes, I do. Like, we're out here talking about making a million dollars a year as the entry point to balling when the 1% of Americans, top earners, start at 440,000 a year. If you make $440,000 a year in here, you are in the 1% earners in America, one of the richest countries in the world. We're fucking confused, my friends. There's people in here that are 29 that, are, that think their life's fucking over next year because they're gonna turn 30 and they don't have their shit figured out. There's fucking 88 year olds running around Jersey that haven't fucking figured out their life. I don't know what miraculous situation of my parents having sex at the right moment, me being born in the Soviet Union, me growing up in Edison and working in a liquor store in Springfield, but I'm telling you right now, whatever those dynamics were, I sit here back home with an amazing amount of gratitude to my perspective. Forget about anything else I've got going on, I'm trying to spend the rest of my life to articulate my perspective so that you can debate it against yours. I'm not trying to have you have my perspective. I'm just trying, I don't think, by the way, I don't think I'm right. I don't think I'm right. I don't think I've earned the ability to tell anybody anything. I think if I disappear tomorrow on some tragic accident, I trend on Twitter for a half a day and then everybody moves on with their lives. Like, I get it, but I'm telling you, If you're fucking here today, please hear me. I can give you every tactic on LinkedIn and TikTok and Facebook and email and text. I can give it to you. You keep watching what I, listen, you wanna have business success? Watch what I do for the rest of my life publicly. Copy it verbatim, but then put in your shit in it. And I promise you, you'll be successful. Cause I'm fucking really good at my shit. That, my friends, is not the interesting part. The interesting part is, why can I do what I do? Why am I not scared to make content on TikTok when it's all teenage people, right? Why am I willing to spend a ton of time having a ton of different shit going on, and if something fails, I don't give a fuck? I have VaynerMedia, I have VaynerSports, I have empathy, I have a million things going on. Inevitably, some of those things are gonna fail. Things that shouldn't fail but they're going to, when you have 87 things, you're not gonna go 87 and oh. My ability to deal with your judgment when I go 70 and 13 is my strength. Why are you only doing one thing? Why don't you do shit? Because you're fucking scared. The question is why? Like, I'm just trying to get to why. Like, who? Like, who's gonna cast judgment? My friends, every person here that's not 100% happy, including myself, is not doing something because of judgment of somebody else. 100. That's the fucking game. More importantly, how do you start chipping away in a world where you were parented or your environment made you that way? How do you chip away? Here's how. You story tell. That is the responsibility and almost the way I feel I live. I have figured out over the last decade or two, really actually half decade to a decade, oh, I have gift for gab. Same reason I could sell, same reason, oh, I'm a good storyteller, so I'm gonna give you stories. Why do I put out those analogies, those clips saying the same shit? Because there's only 15 truths. 
I just have to say them a million different ways to catch you at the right time with the right slang on the right platform at the right moment. I appreciate you too. I appreciate you too. You know how in high school you were worried about your zit and fuck, I used to be scared as shit when I had a zit. I was like, fuck, I don't wanna go to fucking school. What I learned through life was nobody gave a fuck about my zit, they were worried about their zit. The number, why do I tell that story? Because right now, people here are in debt or can't do something because they're just staying above ground, but that's because they bought a house that was too expensive, not using rooms in that house, and they don't have the humility to sell that house and go back to rent because they don't want their friend from high school or their grandma to judge them because we manifested that you have to own a home. And if you did, and now you're not just staying above water and you sold that home and moved into a shittier neighborhood or a smaller house or rented, now your actual life can open up. But no, the ideology of owning a home and the inability to take a step backwards to take three steps forward is gonna make you unhappy till the end. Yes! From the extreme of getting somebody in here this evening to go home and sell their fucking house, to getting, to getting, to getting one of you to not buy a pair of off-whites that you can't afford, in those two extremes are no different than fucking Sally Pants 98 to your mom. This is a game of the edges. This is a game of the edges. Everybody's focused in the middle. 90%, 95%, 99% of the shit you think about and you consume is in the middle so you don't pay attention to the edges. It's a fucking game of the edges. Once you get your relationship down with the seven fucking people that matter the most in your life and actually get to the place of saying, I love you, but fuck you. And once you get to that same relationship over here, which is super simple, I'm not sure I even know you and fuck you. That's the game. Now, don't confuse fuck you. Let me explain what I mean. I roll with empathy and compassion and sympathy. This isn't fuck you for hate. This is I'm not willing to live my life under your judgment of what life is. Because eventually, let me tell you the biggest mistake people make that I've observed through the millions of interactions over the last decade that I consume. There are people right now that are living their life still in their 40s and 50s based on the opinion of their parents. They think they're doing the right thing because they fucking actually love their parents. I get it. I love my parents so uncomfortably much it scares me. But they live it because they're appeasing lawyer, two kids, living in this area, doing this job, don't take risks because we told you not to, we came from a generation that didn't, so you're doing that, or I was once an entrepreneur and fucked it up, and so we were scared, so now you don't do that. They live for their parents, they think it's good because everything's good because you're doing what your parents want, you feel like it's good, and then life keeps going. And then what starts happening is they start to resent their parents because now they're popping to their 50th birthday, their 60th birthday, their 65th birthday. They get a health scare and they're like, fuck. I'm not doing what I wanna be doing. My friends, until our society, and this country especially, redefines success in being happy, not being rich, everybody will continue to go down the path that we're seeing in our society of depression, anxiety, drugs. I believe it the most. Do I believe that there's people here that are lucky that are talented and love something and they build a business that they actually love that process and it makes them a lot of wealth? Yes, I do. I'm one of them. I genuinely love my shit. I love it the most. Thank God it also manifested in financial success. But if you watched my behavior, you would realize it's the chase. When and if the Jets win the Super Bowl before I buy them, I'm probably... When and if the Jets win the Super Bowl before I buy them, you're gonna see a video of like 61 year old me being, fuck, now I gotta buy the Knicks. (laughs) 
what I realized about me, about why do I love garage sailing? Why have I probably rolled up some people in this room's house to buy shit over the last 10 years? It's because I love the hunt. I wake up at five o'clock in the morning on a Saturday after working 90 hours a week because my hobby is to go to fucking Old Wick town-wide sale or fucking Metuchen's town-wide sale two times a year to go through people's trash and buy shit for a dollar that's worth seven. Not because of the dollar and the seven, but because maybe, just maybe, this is the day that I roll up on somebody's house and find a rare 1947 Cracker Jack Green Lantern ring worth 80,000. And even the 80,000 doesn't mean shit. I get paid more to stand right here than that. I just want the fucking hunt. But anyway, um, my new dream is to like have this YouTube channel where like, go around and I would ask kids like, hey, do you want to go for a ride in my car? And specifically, I'd have like a Gallardo or something and then I'd talk about them, or talk with them and be like, hey, what are your like goals and ambitions in life? But I'm just undecided if this is like a reasonable dream to pursue because I really just want to motivate and inspire kids to be like, hey, I want you to go out and do what you want to do. Don't do what everybody's telling you to do. Do it for you. Like, I want to do it. Not because mom wants me to go to college. Like, is this like something reasonable or is that like, it's very Fine. reasonable. I mean, Wrong. A, you just gotta make sure you don't get arrested for trying to roll up on kids and say, hey, get in my car. <laughs> but I'm sure they have that prearranged, I'm just pleasant. So, yeah, I think it's super reasonable. I think, you, Avery, I think you just need to realize that it's probably gonna be two full years of you putting out videos on YouTube before it pops. And so can you afford to like be in a place where you're chasing that when you're not making any money? Can you get a bullshit job that pays you a little something to maintain a little rent and a little food. Like, you know what's funny? When I when I hear people say, it's my dream, I always, it always catches my attention. Cause I'm like, cause I'm always like, is it? Because when I hear people say, it's my dream, then I'm like, oh, this is gonna be easy. Hey Avery, for five years, nothing good's gonna happen. You're gonna work at 7-Eleven or, or at an office or some shit just to pay rent and food so that the other seven hours you can work on driving with Avery. Nothing good is gonna happen for five years. You're not gonna be fucking Gary B. You're not gonna fucking pop. You're not gonna make money. You're not. And if you're like that, then it is your dream and let's go. Yes, it's if So all you need to do is find an amazing, and this is a big, Big shout out to everybody who's got a dream. The number one way as a young person to win on a dream is to find a bullshit job that doesn't take up a lot of time. Let me say it one more time because it's confusing as fuck. The way you actually, because if you went right out of school and started doing this and you had a couple of dollars saved up and you're you're couch serving or your parents are paying for it or whatever, cool, but guess what? It's only gonna last two or three months because you're not gonna, everyone's like, oh, by month six, I'll be making $100,000 on ads on YouTube. It never happens. So the way to actually live a dream usually is for that dream to be your side hustle but takes up all your free time because it's your dream now, right? It's not yeah. like kinda, it's your dream now. You know, It takes away from 2K, takes away from hanging with your boys. It takes away from having a girlfriend, boyfriend. It takes away from shit. It's a fucking dream. The way to fucking have a dream is for you, what I'm listening, maybe you get a job as, you know, at a uh, car business because you fuck with them, right? Like maybe you yeah. fucking work at, maybe you're a fucking, at a, you're a receptionist at a fucking car dealership. No, I did that. I swear, I worked at Mitsubishi. I was the receptionist, I was the valet, I worked in parts. Like I've done all this car stuff. I've been around people. I'm definitely a people person, which is why I feel like I have to do this because I want people to be like, good. he can do it. Like everybody can. Avery, like, good. Uh, Get a job uh, at a school that pays for you to be able to have a roof and eat clearly not the kind of job that's going to give you a mansion and caviar the kind of job that's going to give you bojangles and three roommates right yeah and and then you have six hours seven hours a day to fucking do your dream it's very feasible is the concept right you know the concept's right fucking the coffee with fucking comedians seinfeld shit you've seen this already of course it's feasible it's just going to come down to how talented you are I just wasn't sure if like, I, I wasn't sure if you were gonna suggest like a podcast or like do something else besides like, oh, go check out this Lambo and go for a ride. 
good news. When you do the Lambo and go for a ride, A, you got to figure out how you're going to get these cars. But, you know, that I have a feeling you're going to try to figure that out. But Engineering. It's fine. But, yep. But you strip the audio and you make it a podcast. So you film it. You make it a, my podcast is a top 200 podcast in the world. And I never sit down, I mean, rarely sit down and actually do a podcast. It's just a script audio from shit I do like this. Okay. All right, that makes sense. I, I can roll with that. The framework, Avery, is side job to pay for you to chase your dream for a long time. People jump into their dream, Dustin and have no money, have no savings, have no reserves, and they have to quit after five weeks because miraculously, they didn't become fucking Kevin Hart after two videos about humor. What they need to do is get that bullshit job, especially the kind, the reason I like receptionists and other shit like that is like, get me a job that actually lets me be on my phone six of the seven hours, as long as I'm taking care of the inbound, so I can even keep pumping my shit. That pays, I get two roommates, I have a roof. I want people, to have bullshit jobs and save money, which is why I'm like, hey, make 30, make 29K, but live a 22K life so you save, right? And it's obviously taxes or whatever, but like you know, people get the point. I want you to make 29K, save a thousand a year and work on your fucking dream. Your fucking dream. Everyone talks about fucking dreams. If it's a fucking dream, you should bleed out of your eyes. If it's a fucking dream, you should sweat for a decade. It's a fucking dream. People think dreams are being handed out here like fucking candy. If there was, out of all the things we talked about, if on my parting shot I can inject something into you, it would be one thing. For you to feel the way I feel right now about 43 years old. If you knew that, if you actually knew how much more time you had, if you could context how uncomfortably young you are, if you guys could understand that you're part of a generation, that means you're gonna live four, four, four more full lives. From the day you were fucking born to right now, you're gonna do that four more times. If you can contextualize that, if you could contextualize the blessings you guys have, that you don't live in a culture where you're expected to be married at 25 and have a kid at 26, that there is normalcy created around the fact that you can go and have a 20 year career and then start your family if you chemically or intuitively or culturally or internally want that for yourself. We are being so confused by the macro media landscape and the political landscape, it has never been a better time to be alive in the history of the world. For everybody who's being persecuted for looking different, I remind a lot of my friends to go talk to their great grandparents and ask them how it went for them. This is why, like, this is why we need to spend more time with elderly people that are not our relatives. You want equal pay and like this and that? Cool. Go talk to a 63 year old professional woman. Like, shit's good. And the shit, a lot's bad. You get to choose how you look at it. Not me, not them, you. You just haven't contextualized time. I'm yelling at you to waste eight years just to begin the process of trying to do something. I'm telling you, and I know I'm right, like in my fucking soul, that you should waste the way you see the world, eight years on resources and time, just to start the thesis of what you should do with your life. And a bunch of you debated heavily if this was the right internship versus a different one and like what will happen and this and that. None of it fucking matters. If you actually knew that you would never find out what the alternative was, shit would get real good. You know how easy it is for me to make decisions? Super easy. Do you know why? I wouldn't know what the alternative was. Because you, it's not practical. I don't have time to dwell on the fact that I passed on Uber twice, which was my best friend of any investment that I made. Every person I invested in was not as close to me as Travis was, and for some miraculous cosmic reason, I passed on Uber twice, which made up, means that my $50,000 investment, which would have been worth $700 million today, didn't happen. And when I tell you I don't think about it at all, here's why. 
I'm smart and thoughtful enough of knowing how life works. Had I made that investment, everything would be different. Maybe I'd be going to India to give a keynote about that investment because I would have had much bigger profile, much different resources, and maybe in that private flight, maybe that flight would have gone down and I would be dead. It's the biggest weakness everyone has. They're trying to spend time on something that doesn't exist. There is no time machine. Sorry you picked the wrong school or sorority or girlfriend or major. Sorry. What are we gonna do? You, what, you, we're gonna build a time machine here? That's your practical optimism. Sure is. Cause it's both optimistic and way more practical. Cause the punches are the framework. Especially if you're fucking on the offense versus dwelling. Everything will work out if you decide everything will work out. It's very real. My mom lost her mom at five. She was in the Soviet fucking union. Real communism. Her dad then went to jail for a decade. That's a fucking tough hand. She's the most optimistic fucking person I know. You're uncomfortably in control. Yet this is the great generation of feeling we're not. Google's in control. Trump's in control. Brexit is in control. My parents are in control. You want your parents to not have control? Stop taking their money. It happens real fast. Real, 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 real fast. And all that means is you just have to live a little more humble. Which, oh by the way, would most likely lead to much better behavior by you going forward. And a shocking, shocking level of happiness. I don't want a boat, I don't want a fancy car, I don't want jewelry or art. But, but I don't judge other people. If, they, if you can afford it, do whatever the hell you want. Give it all away to charity, buy a $5 million painting. If you can afford, especially if you made it, if you made the money and you can afford it, you're my favorite person. Because then you can do whatever the hell you want with your money. I think, and by the way, if you inherit it, you inherited it. You know, so you were in a fortune situation. Obviously I don't look at that the same way because I admire people who make it. But no, I do not. I'm unbelievably unimpressed with somebody who flaunts their money with things. I don't judge it, but it doesn't get me excited at, I mean, at all. I've never looked at anything and been impressed by it for its cost. I don't even know what things cost. Yeah. I don't, you know, like, you know when I go to like, if I'm in, you know, I think a lot about when I'm in Cannes for the marketing festival or if I'm in Beverly Hills for an event or, I remember I was somewhere, it was like very fancy cars. I don't know what is, what's a $500,000 car, what's a $5 car, like it just, jewelry, forget about it, I have no idea, art, no clue. It's just not on my radar. No, I don't, I don't, I don't think about that at all. I, I think you try to find the cross section of what you like and where the market's going. You know, that's the best. That's the best. That's the best. Some people are lucky like me where like actually building businesses and running a business is what they like. So it's almost agnostic whether it's wine or marketing. It almost doesn't matter, which is a great luxury. But, um, but, but I think it comes down to happiness, right? So for example, you know, when I hear you ask that question, I would start, the next question I would ask you is what's your ambition? Financially, happy wise, for how long, you know, I, don't, I think a lot of people should build around their interests and their hobbies, businesses, because I think it's a more, it's a, I, I think it's a better life to be happy and make 200,000 a year or 55,000 or 5,000 and be happy than to make a million and be miserable. I really believe that. It's not sustainable. Unhappiness is not sustainable. I, I think, but there's a lot of ways to do it. I'll give you an example. If you love, uh, football, soccer, football, right? Okay, so that's your passion, right? Now when you think about a business, when you go back to the market, yeah. 
do you build 433 and a huge Instagram page? Do you build a direct to consumer soccer ball business? Do you buy football jerseys and resell them on Facebook Marketplace? You see where I'm going? So I feel like there's a way to do both and my opinion is if you love football, then you're gonna be willing to be up at 11 o'clock at night DMing and trying to sell football jerseys whereas if you're trying to do cryptocurrency because you think there's money there, you're not interested, you're there for the money. I was very fortunate. I was a failure my whole life. You know, when you, yeah, I mean, when you're, when you're a bad student, mm-hmm. you're used to failure. You know, I was a bad student. I wasn't, I, I loved sports. I played a lot of sports, but I wasn't great at sports. Um, so I was dealing with adversity and fail. You know, when you're an immigrant, mm-hmm. when you don't come from much, when you're little, you know, I was a little guy, when you're bad at school, when you're, there was nothing that was, and then I was a businessman, so when I would knock on doors and ask to wash somebody's car, you know, 90 out of 95 people said no. When I stood there at a lemonade stand, 100 cars would drive by for every one that would stop. So I was used to failure. Failure was my foundation, which is why I succeeded. Which is why you're not afraid to, you know, lose Most people are, you know, follow rules, go to school, do the right thing, and, and create a scenario where failure is scary. The biggest key is, my friends, is one, not worrying about other people's opinions because if you worry about other people's opinions, you're gonna quit. Number two, the biggest mistake millennials, not only in Indonesia but in the world, make is they're just not patient. You know, it takes 10 years, 15 years to build something meaningful for 99% of people. Everybody, you know, because you live in a world where you have instant gratification, people got confused and think for the same way that they can watch any show they want or pull up anything they want on the phone or Google search something that they can build a million dollar business that fast too. So patience and and really focusing on your internal skills and then most of all just understanding that the level of hard work that it takes to actually build something meaningful is enormous. It's just hard. It's hard. It's hard and it's gonna take a very long time. Do you still wanna do it? Yeah, I genuinely like what I do. You know, right. like, like the game for me is like, like I'd rather be building businesses, I'd rather be doing this right now than something else. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's, it's almost this crazy liberating thing where it's like, what if you could just do whatever you wanted, Katie? You know, like what would you do? And I don't. I think most people put work into this place of like, this is a requirement to do what I want to do. Yeah. And for me, it's just what I've always wanted to do. It's why I struggled so much in school. Like all I would do is daydream about starting a business or, and I'm talking about third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. Like I can't wait to get home and do this idea. Or I can't wait to tell Robbie and Marissa we're gonna do this. You know, or like, you know, like, you know, or, oh my, and when baseball cards hit me, that was game over. Then it was so much to learn, you know, like, and memorize and, and then wine. It's just always like the interest, you know? Mm-hmm. So, so for you, it's, it's just about presence. Like it's about enjoying yourself in every moment or. Yeah. It's, you, you know, I, I, yeah. Like I like every part of it. You know, it's kind of like when I see those athletes, you know, it's why I associated with, rest in peace, Kobe Bryant so much. I, I genuinely could see from afar that he loved practice and yeah. rehabbing injuries as much as he did scoring 82 points in a game. Right. I understand that. I enjoy last night, 9.40 p.m., being in a meeting, trying to find costs to save, to save jobs at VaynerMedia, which is a devastating, you're literally talking about, okay, we have to do this or, Susie Magoo might have to be let go. And I know Susie Magoo. I know her mom has got uh, cancer. I know that, you know, and so like, these are devastating difficulties of being an executive and a leader during these times. Yet, I love that challenge, even though that's not fun. It's much more fun when the world is not melting, when you aren't dealing with liquidity issues in the global economy, when you don't have to make those decisions. It's much more fun, you know, but at the same token, I'm up for that challenge. I do enjoy that. Just like it's not fun rehabbing, you know, broken arm, but if you love it, if you fucking actually love it, if you, you know, all of it, all of it, 
And, and to me, the stress and the accolades being on the front page of, a, of Inc. Magazine or being in a meeting last night at 9.40, you know, seven, 14 hours into your day, making tough decisions, leading a group of other leaders who are probably wanna be off the Zoom because it's 9.40 at night already, you know what I mean? Who are, you know, finding themselves working more, not less during this time. You know, that's, that's real shit. And so to me, that's loving my game. People love entrepreneurship when it's convenient. People love being, you know, a, a lawyer when they litigate, but not when they, you know, are behind the scenes. Like, and when you're that, you're vulnerable because then you're not completely, fully succumbed to that love, that process. That's so. That's what I mean when I talk about loving my game. Every part of it, not just the parts that are convenient, not just the parts that bring me what I want. People, are, like I'm telling you, the far majority of entrepreneurs that position themselves right now, because I've watched my whole life, like. They love what entrepreneurship does for their clout, for their credit, for the potential of the boat they can buy with it. They don't love it. Yeah. So in those moments, like I feel like people are becoming entrepreneurs because they have a thing that they want to do, right? But, but they doing don't a thing, yeah, support. doing a thing, you could do a thing without having all the baggage that comes with being an entrepreneur. Right. Or, or it could be a side hustle, or it could be a nonprofit, or it, or you could be the number two to somebody who's already doing it in a way that you admire and is incredible. Right. But if, but, or, or you could have the humility to do it exactly how you want, it's your thing, but you just might make 49,000 a year. The, some of the most successful entrepreneurs I know make 49,000 a year. It's because they love honey, they have four B things in the backyard, they hand package it, they sell it for 71,000 a year with a ton of profit, so they make 49,000, and they're happy as fuck. They're just not fucking living their life with an Escalade and Vegas nights and private jets, and, 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 and that I admire way more than the people that are making pretend they're living that life. Yeah, yeah, I hear so that. You see where I'm going? Like, mm -hmm. when people are like, well, but Gary, I have to see my vision through. I'm like, amazing. You could be an entrepreneur, see your vision through, but, Let's talk about the financial part because you're overlaying that you need to also be a millionaire and your passion and your idea is, and your ability is, your ability as an artist and a thinker is high, but as a business operator to make a million dollars with it, because guess what, Katie? If I started a fucking honey company, it would do $10 million. Right, yeah. Because yeah. I have the operations and marketing and, and all those HR, all the variables that lead to that. I just want people to be happy making 49,000 with their passion and loving all the process. Because I can tell you one thing I wouldn't love. I wouldn't love jarring up the honey. Right, okay, so that's, I mean, that's kind of my question. But I can make 10 million and afford to pay somebody to do it. Yeah, right. I did my own social media. All you fuckers that are like, oh, you got a team? Fuck you, I did my own social media for eight years without anybody on my team, because I loved right. it which made yeah. me the best at it, which then let me be able to afford to hire it, which then be able, enabled me to be able to judge if somebody was good at it because I fucking did it first. Yeah, so you, so that's where the patience kind of seems to come in, right? Like mm -hmm. you have to make, the jump to make the jump to make the jump. Okay. That's why patience is so huge because everybody who's struggling with what I'm just talking about right now, if they thought about in 15 year terms, instead of 15 week terms, they would get excited about doing it. It would also put pressure on you to say, do you actually love this? I'm very fascinated by the conversation of work ethic, hustle, overworking. I'm fascinated by people's ability to not take on accountability. I, I never feel like my points of view and my thoughts and my hot takes and my passions and my story are right. I've never believed that in my life. I don't think they're right. I think I enjoy sharing them because I enjoy sharing them. I'm a communicator. There's some selfish needs of communicating, I'm sure. But like, I share them. But everybody shares them. This thought that, you know, I, I think one of the biggest things we need to get more thoughtful about is this question, which is, the answer to the question is by conversating with yourself and trying to develop self-awareness and not look for outside validation. When people email me and say, Gary Vee, I've been hustling 15 hours a day. I'm like, you getting enough rest? You good? Are you, like, are you pumped? Like with intention, my intention is to be happy. And so I'm not gonna apologize for enjoying my work. Like I don't 
need validation for my work. My work is not my family or my thing. You know, I watch these conversations. I'm fascinated by them. I respect other people's points of view. I just, I don't think that, I just want to make sure that they don't think they're right either. A lot of people that push against hard work, hustle, are people who've already hustled and didn't find fulfillment from it, but maybe somebody else did. In the same way that I haven't had to clarify my points of view. There are plenty of interviews in 2010 where my point of view on Crush It was make 86,000 a year and talk about strawberries. I've been talking about happiness the whole time. I have evolved and, and have been forced because I feel like I've been dragged into being a poster child of something that I don't believe in in creating clarity, but I think to answer your question directly, I think you have to answer that for yourself and what I would say is don't overjudge yourself in every chapter. It's okay to be losing by 14 points at the end of the first quarter of an NBA game. You can win that game. And so if you're, if you're like working 15 hours a day for a year because you're starting your videography business, that's probably okay. It does take work to start something. If you've achieved some level of success three years in, and you don't want to take it to a $10 million business from a $3 million business because you've fallen in love and you've started a family and you want to go to wiffle, you want to play wiffle ball outside with your child, that's amazing. There, there is no right. There's only right for you. More importantly, there is no line in the sand. I'll be very honest with you. I'm, I'm, I'm unbelievably excited to evolve. There may, be a re- there may be a time where I don't want to be as passionate about my work and there may be some cause or some game or who the heck knows what I'll get excited about. Um, And so I think to answer your question, it's A, to do it for yourself, B, to know that it's going to ebb and flow. When you're 96 in debt in the basement, you're grinding. When you're not in the same place, you don't have to do the same things. You may still want to. I still want to. I love operating. I, you know, I was afforded a lot of opportunities besides building VaynerMedia and having a client service business, thousand employees, a lot of chaos. I enjoy that. And look, there's a lot of people, I don't post pictures of my family on social media. Lots of people do. I could judge that, I choose not to. Um, I think there's a lot of judgment in the air on this issue right now. Um, and so yeah, I'm trying to do a better job over the last year of clarifying it because I don't want to be dragged down in the momentum of something I don't believe in which is why in the world would I believe in, why would any human being want somebody to burn out and not be happy? But guess what? I would be burnt out and unhappy if I worked nine to five. I know unbelievable amounts of unhappiness from people that work 40 hours a week. Who gets to decide? Definitely not me, and definitely not people who are pushing very hard in what they perceive to be my point of view on this issue. I think I've been consistent. I could have been better at clarifying it along the way. I think one of the things that is probably evolving my content is as I have more attention, I feel a greater responsibility. And so I've become very passionate about creating more context. I think I'm at my best when I have time to talk like this and I'm not when I'm too excited on stage or in a one second clip. You know, I I think that I'm, I'm, becoming more thoughtful because I'm surprised at the sheer level of quick judgments that our society has become comfortable with. I wrote that book in 2008 when people, like the economy collapsed and this internet thing emerged and there was a land grab. There was an amazing opportunity if you were a fast mover on those platforms and those things played out. You know, it's not as easy to build a huge personal brand or a media property on YouTube or podcast or Instagram as it was five years ago. It's supply and demand. You know, so I don't feel anything or any, like it's contextual. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, I think you should have spent all your money on Manhattan real estate 180 years ago. (laughs) And that was a good bet. Yeah. So yeah, I, you know, I also, I also, and so, one of the things that's struck me in the last year that I'm like, oh, wait a minute, these people think they're right. I never think I'm right, ever. I think I'm communicating my observations. I have no interest in telling anybody how to do anything. Really, I don't. I don't have that level of audacity. And I think, I think what I'm watching is 
much more, much, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm, surpri- I'm surprised that some of my friend contemporaries that take different points of view are coming at it with more of a, I'm right, you're wrong. You know? That's been really interesting to me. That's something I wanna throw more in the air. It's probably why I'm yapping now and being late. Yeah. Because I respect your platform and like just kind of respect your point of view on this. Like, I'm surprised that we've gotten, not surprised, we are in that place. Um, and so I wanna, I'm gonna do a much better job over the next half decade to say, look, this is how I see it. These are my circumstances. And I think, I'm, I also am pretty aware of my happiness. And not that everybody has the same chemicals or circumstances, but I, I would feel remiss not to speak about what I see. I also think that when we start demonizing work ethic, we get into a, I, I think we are the byproduct of the last 10 years being so fruitful. You know, a lot of the people that push against me are venture-backed company founders who were able to raise $25 million over four years based on their idea by never running a profitable company. So everybody, and not that they're wrong, I just think everybody has different perspectives. So I think we need to get into a healthier, you know, minimalism, I'm sure, I, I don't know. I assume there's some sort of counter debate to it. And I think, you know, for, for example, I think I both love work ethic and minimalism. And I think they're, you know, I already know that I'm a kind of enigma and have like some pretty contradictions within me. So I'm hoping that because of that, and that's just the luck of the draw of DNA, um, and given the platform that I've earned and have been afforded, um, maybe I can create some better conversations because I think, I think it'd be a really good time for all of us in any sector about any debate, red versus white wine, let alone mil- minimalism, anti-minimalism, hustle, anti It's a really good time to get back to a cordial state of debate. I also know it's contextual. Like how can't you tell somebody who's not afforded any opportunities that work ethic isn't gonna help them? There's no, no thing you can pull up that speaks to me saying money is happiness. I wasn't raised in that environment, I know it's not true. I think that people need to try to be self-aware about what makes them happy and doesn't make them happy. Right now, social me- I view social media as a, as a mirror. I think what people are putting out is an incredible indicator of what's inside of them. So right now there's a lot of political anxiety there's a lot of ideological anxiety. And so what we're seeing is a lot of judgment. You know, I think, you know, the early days, especially when you and I were on it, like there was a lot of Nirvana early users. It was very soft. I think you are seeing um, a different version of that today. But that is, you know, <laughs> getting off of social is no different than stop watching CNN or Fox every night or reading the journal or the Times. Um, we consume as animals. And I think if one feels overwhelmed, they should stop consuming. But I don't put social media consumption in a very different place than the films and music and, and books that one reads. Like, the collective replies of people's angst is no different than Kurt Cobain's singular angst, other than it's a collective versus a singular. And so, I think it's great and like when people are like, oh, like, like, what are you gonna think about that? I'm like, I don't care about social media. I really don't. I care about humans communicating with each other. I'm fascinated by communication and I'm fascinated that we now have a collective ability to communicate at a scale that we've never seen before and I think right now people are focusing on the downside of that and I think we're forgetting the upside of it. There's so much love and greatness going on every day. I think humans find what they're looking for. You're signing into Twitter to find a fight or to find somebody to fight with or to see some negativity, you're gonna find it. I think if you go to Twitter or Instagram to find happiness and positivity, it's there at scale.